Good evening, everyone. The term contrarian investor is one that is a lot more common these days in the stock market world than it was about 10 years ago. The general idea of a contrarian investor is someone who zigs when everyone else zags, someone who is buying when everyone else is selling, or someone who's selling when everyone else is buying. A lot of people claim that they're contrarian investors until everything hits the fan and then they're running to the exits faster than anybody else when the market goes down. Bill Ackman, a contemporary fund, a hedge fund manager who uh, is relatively controversial for some of the things that he said, um, particularly his fights with other uh, big money managers, um, is a well-known contrarian investor. Apparently he made a ton of money in 2020 in March when uh, he placed a bet for $27 million um, that the market would, uh, would go down um, and uh, he made $2.7 billion uh, at the end of uh, that trade in about a month apparently. That's an example of a contrarian investor. Warren Buffett on the other hand, he's not necessarily a contrarian investor. He's someone who likes a good deal, but he's not trying to do things that other investors are not doing. Why am I mentioning the idea of contrarian investors? Because I believe in the beginning of our Parsha this week, Parsha Shamos, we see a prime example of a contrarian. How? Jewish people in Mitzrayim and Pyro, the ruler turns the Jews into public enemy number one. He starts a campaign that we have to enslave the Jewish people, we have to subjugate them. Why? Because they're becoming like a fifth element in the country. <clears throat> they are people who might turn against us if we're attacked. Therefore, we have to enslave them. And we're going to have them build up the country. Unlike the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC under Roosevelt, the Jews were not free to go and they were not paid for their labor. And as part of their campaign to uh, deal with the Jewish menace in the land of Egypt, Paro tells some of the prime midwives, Shifra and Pua, who our rabbis identify as being Yocheved and Miriam, Yocheved was Aaron and Moshe's mother, Miriam was their sister. And he tells them, anytime you see a Jewish baby being born, if it's a boy, I want you to kill them. If it's a girl, let the girls live. <laughs> Pyro was intending to control the Jewish population and uh, over time create a society that would be, I don't know the Egyptian equivalent of the German term of Judenrein, but his goal is to make sure there would be no more Jews, no more descendants of Abraham living in the land of Egypt. Yet, these midwives do the contrarian thing. The entire nation is up in arms, we've got to get rid of the Jews, we've got to enslave them. We have to be rid of this menace. And these midwives say, we're not going to do that. We're not going to kill babies. That's murder. It's wrong. This wasn't quite abortion because the baby was being delivered, but we're not killing this child just because you don't like him, Pyro. Now, they didn't actually make this statement to his face. They let the babies live. And when Pyro confronts them, they lie. They say, well, what do you want? The, these, uh, these Jewish women don't need us. By the time we get there, they're already born. I mean, the, the problem is that they didn't have ambulances back in the day. So, you know, imagine someone running in a rickshaw and going, wee you, wee you, wee you. Like, you have all these people running around. It's, it's, it, it takes time, you know. They didn't have traffic lights to uh, be able to pull in the left lane in opposing traffic. You know, okay, I know rickshaws are more of a uh, Indian, uh, Asian, you know, type of uh, apparatus. 
Um, and I doubt Pyro would let these midwives drive around in his chariots, but you get the idea. They said, we can't, we can't make it there in time. It's not our fault. But they did the heroic thing. You could ask, well, why didn't they protest? Well, back in the day before um, the uh, you know, advent of uh, peaceful protests uh, and the like, or civil disobedience, um, if you disobeyed the king, you were as good as dead. There's no concept of free speech or democracy. What they did is like defying the Nazi regime at the height of their power in 1941, taking the Jews and hiding them. That's what they did. They did what wasn't popular. They did what was contrary to public opinion. Right? You could imagine that if they would have been um, exposed on MSNBC or CNN, the pundits who would have been critiquing their performance would not have said very nice things about them. They probably would have said things along the defund the midwives or Egyptian lives matter. Getting, saying that the Jewish problem is too big of a menace that you have to try harder, Shifra and Pura. You're not doing your job. You're supposed to be aborting these Jewish babies. You must be aborting the Jewish menace. So what was the reward for their heroism? What was the reward to Shifra and Pua for bucking the national Egyptian trend for doing the right thing, for keeping these babies alive? Our rabbis tell us in the Tractate of Sota, Folio 11b, Mesecha Sota da Firal from Bez, that God rewarded Shifra and Pua by ensuring that the priesthood, the kahuna, and Jewish kingship would come out of these two ladies. That the foundation of Jewish leadership would be rooted in heroism, would be rooted in standing up for what's right, even if it's not popular. <coughs> to ensure that what had to be done, got done. These Jewish babies needed to be saved. They were going to do it. They were going to put their lives on the line. They just weren't going to tell it to pirate his face because they were smart. The message to us is that if we want to be great people, if we want to be great Jews, the goal is not to buck society for the sake of bucking society. This isn't Portland where we ride every 15 minutes because we don't like something going on in the country. That, we're not Portland. We don't do that. The goal is not to be contrary for the sake of being contrary. And if you do that in investing, you're not a contrarian, you're an idiot because you're going to blow through your account value by making trades that no one wants to just for the sake of making trades that are not popular. That's not what we're advocating. What we're advocating for is that to be great people and to be great Jews is to buck trends in society that are against the will of the Almighty. To do things not because they're popular, but because they're the right thing to do. And if we do so, God will reward us as well like he did for Shifra and Pua, for Miriam and Yocheved. He'll take care of you. And Shifra and Pua did not see the, that blessing. They didn't see those homes, as the Torah says, for generations. Granted, Aaron became the high priest a few years after they left Egypt, but that was about 83 years after this showdown with Pyro. And the kingship didn't happen for hundreds of years after that. But the Torah tells us that God built them homes. God established their household, so to speak, for the priests, for the Kohanim, and for the kings, for the Malachim, because God takes care of people who do the right thing. Do the right thing, God will take care of you. Have a great week.